Marie Dorian was the daughter of a French-Canadian father and a Native American mother. A seasoned survivalist, she would become the only female member of John Jacob Astor's legendary Astoria expedition. Along with her husband and a band of trappers, Marie would traverse mountains, plains, and raging rivers. And she did it all, with her children in tow. Today, we're going to take a look at the insane untold story of Marie Dorian, the most badass woman in American history. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other explorer heroes you would like to hear about. Okay, next stop, the American frontier. Not much is known about Marie Dorian's early life. Though she was a member of the Iowa tribe, she had no known Native American name, and historians believe that she was likely baptized into the Roman Catholic Church at an early age. While still a teenager, Marie married a half-French-Canadian, half-Sioux man named Pierre Dorian, and the two settled in the area that is today known as Yankton, South Dakota. Pierre made his living as a fur trader, and Marie typically accompanied him on his buying and selling route. It took them through the areas that would become the states of Missouri, Nebraska, Iowa, North and South Dakota, and Arkansas. At least one historian believes it is likely that Marie knew Sacagawea during this time, since they both were the wives of translators who worked in and around the St. Louis area. Pierre Dorian was hired for Astor's expedition mostly because he spoke a variety of Sioux languages and dialects fluently. His mother was a Sioux, and his father, Pierre Sr., had even worked as an interpreter for Lewis and Clark. In 1811, Pierre, Marie, and their two sons, aged two and four, joined John Jacob Astor's expedition. However, before this starts to sound too inspiring, know that the trip didn't get off to the best start. According to historians, at one of the earliest stops, Pierre severely beat Marie when she asked to stay behind with the native Osage residents. The attack is believed to have been so vicious that she had to run to the woods to get away from him. Not cool, Pierre. Nevertheless, Marie and her children would continue to accompany the party into the wilderness, with Marie the only woman and bearing sole responsibility for the welfare of the children. And if you don't like Pierre, stick around. He might just get his comeuppance. New York fur magnate John Jacob Astor was rich, but he wanted to be richer. This meant expanding his fur trading empire beyond the Great Lakes in an effort to monopolize the business. There was a catch, though. The British, Canadian, and other interests that already had claims in the area weren't too keen on letting him get a foothold. In 1810, just six years after Sacagawea led the Lewis and Clark expedition west, Astor hired 29-year-old Wilson Price Hunt to lead an expedition of his own. The team would search for an overland route from Missouri to Oregon country and establish a community at the mouth of the Columbia River. Astor wanted to control more of the resources being traded in Asia, and he thought Oregon, where the Columbia River began, would be the perfect spot for a base. As a bonus, the overland expedition would give him a chance to establish outposts and contacts between his eastern and western headquarters. Hunt was instructed to spend as much as needed to get the best translators and scouts. Despite this, the expedition met with setbacks. Inexperienced leadership and poor timing delayed their departure, and by the time Pierre Dorian was finally hired, the expedition was already delayed several months. With the new staff, the expedition finally got underway, but Astor's goal of a fur monopoly would never be fully realized. The Astoria expedition was well-funded, but not so well-prepared. When they left, the group departed with an inadequate number of horses. This meant most of the horses had to be used as pack animals, though Pierre managed to snag one to ride on. Marie was left to walk alongside her husband, with her youngest child strapped to her back. Not cool, Pierre. They kept this up until the party reached the Snake River, a tributary of the Columbia at which point they abandoned their animals and constructed canoes to navigate the waters. The waterborne part of the trip turned out to be difficult to navigate. In fact, one person drowned, and the bulk of the expedition's food supplies were swept into the current, never to be seen again. Now without horses or canoes, the party had to continue on foot. Murray walked along the banks with her two sons, keeping pace with the rest of the expedition without a murmur. 
After encountering a small band of natives on November 17th, Pierre was finally able to buy a horse for Marie to ride on. That's more like it, Pierre. In addition to being responsible for her two children during the expedition, Marie had one other inconvenience to contend with. She was eight months pregnant. She likely didn't know her condition when she first departed, but once on the trail, there was no turning back. As her due date drew near, the members of her party gave her a horse to use. Then, in December of 1811, she gave birth to her third child. After the birth, the group apparently considered killing and cooking Marie's horse for dinner, as they were all starving. It wasn't a crazy plan, but under the circumstances, they ultimately, if perhaps reluctantly, voted not to. Marie got to keep riding for a while. It would be a great story if Marie's infant child, born under such unlikely and harrowing circumstances, went on to live a healthy, adventurous life. But it didn't go that way. Marie's child would barely live three months. Several weeks after the birth, the Astor expedition came across an encampment of Umatillas in the Grand Ronde Valley. The women were solicitous and nurturing and made a valiant attempt to nurse the considerably debilitated mother and child back to health. But while the mother pulled through, the baby didn't survive. In July of 1813, a year and a half after their first expedition ended, Marie and her family set out for an area in what is present-day Idaho on a beaver trapping mission. This time, Marie and her children remained at the base camp for a time, while Pierre worked at a smaller trapping camp a few days' ride away. And all went well, at least for a little while. But one day, a Shoshone Indian who had become friendly with Marie warned her that a band of Bannocks were going forth and systematically burning trappers' camps. Cell phone coverage at the time was lacking, to say the least, as was any modern communication technology, so Marie used what technology she had. She saddled up her horse like an action hero and rode out, children in tow, to warn her husband of the impending danger. When Marie reached her destination three days later, she discovered that despite her best efforts, she was too late. Her husband, along with almost his entire party, had been ambushed and slaughtered. Just one of the men, Giles Leclerc, was still alive, but he was badly wounded. Marie strapped the man to a horse and guided the animal back to the base camp through three days of Arctic winter tempests. Marie's attempt to save him was heroic, but Leclerc perished en route. That must have been pretty hard to take, but nothing compared to what awaited her. Upon arriving back at the base camp, Marie found that the inhabitants there had also been murdered, mutilated, and scalped. Faced with a camp full of the non-living, Marie and her children set out for civilization and refuge in the depths of winter. After 10 days of travel, their progress was halted by the deep mountain snows. To save herself and her children, Marie built a shelter of wood and animal skins. But shelter was only one problem she had to deal with. Shortly after she established their makeshift shelter, the family ran out of food. Marie had to kill their two horses and ration their meat to help the family survive for 53 days. When spring came, the family set out once again, on foot. The way seemed clear at first, but the danger wasn't over. Marie and the children were caught in a surprise blizzard. The children's feet were bleeding and they were too debilitated to go on, but there was nowhere to go back to. Alone, in the wilderness, in a storm, with her children, Marie made the difficult choices that offered the best, although narrow, path to survival. She dug a hole and lined it with fur. She placed her sons in the hole, and then she ventured out on her own to find help. She was eventually found, exhausted and partially snowblind, by natives from the Walla Walla tribe, who took her in and sent a party to rescue her sons. Finally, she was reunited with a Fort Astoria group who relocated her and her children to Fort Okanagan in present-day Washington. With Pierre gone, Marie was again single, and apparently ready to mingle. She eventually took a common-law husband named Louis Joseph Veneer. The couple had a daughter. Marie and Louis may have lived happily, but not forever after. Veneer was later murdered, a testament to the rough and wild nature of pioneer-era America. But they say the third time is a charm. Marie later married Jean-Baptiste Toupin and had another two children. The couple settled near St. Louis, Oregon, on the French Prairie, where Marie acquired the nickname Madame Iowa. She lived into her early 60s and died on September 5, 1850. 
Her grave lies outside St. Louis Catholic Church in Oregon, and today there is a plaque devoted to her in the Blue Mountains. So what do you think? How do your survival skills compare to Marie Dorian's? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.